with us today. I want to pray uh, before I get into my message, and uh, this morning I'd like to kneel as I do that. Would you bow your heads, though, with me? Gracious God in heaven, what a joyous privilege it is to be able to speak your word and to be able to represent you before your people. I pray for your spirit to be continually on this place and upon every heart that's here. There's no accidents uh, that those who are here are here today, Father. They're here because you have a special message and blessing for them. We know that we've already experienced much of that through our prayers and our music, our stories, our offerings, and the other aspects of worship that we've experienced. But Father, in this moment, we just seek you one more time and ask that your voice would be heard in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Strong people. A couple questions for you this morning as I begin. Are you Seventh day Adventist today? Are you a people of prophecy? Are you the remnant people of Revelation? Are you a strong? people rhetorical question i'm not asking for responses on this i want you just to answer it in your own heart has your faith ever really been tested I, I i mean this in a very somber way i know that in small ways our faith is tested every day uh you know every time you can't get that closest parking spot in walmart your faith is tested Lord, I thought you were on my side. How come I have to walk another 15 feet? I realize we have minor tests of faith regularly. But has your faith ever really, like where you're going to lose your job if you keep your faith? Maybe you're going to lose a relationship if you keep your faith. Or at least that's what's on the line. Have you, when was the last time your faith was really tested? Or has it ever really been tested? Do you really think that we're going to make it through the last days without our faith really being tested? Do you believe that we're in the last days? I believe we are. And we've been teaching that for a hundred and 50 years of Seventh-day Adventists, that we are living at the end of prophecy. We are the remnant. remnant. Remnant means remainder. We're at the end. And prophecy is nearing its conclusion. And we need to be a strong people, strong in our faith in the days in which we live. Of course, there's always we always want to be strong no matter what days we live in. But if we are the people of prophecy, we need to have a strong faith. Last week I talked about a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. For our offertory, I noticed David played Cornerstone. And uh, one of the lines in that is, I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Holy trust in Jesus' name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. His name, when you need a champion, he is the Lord Sabaoth. He is the commander of armies. When you need a provider, his name is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. When you need tenderness, he is the lamb. When you need strength, he is the lion. When you need direction, he is the light. When you're in the darkness, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is, in His name, everything that we need. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. I'm telling you, this has been my, my mantra here recently. Because I have needed it. I've needed that strength of knowledge that in the days in which we live, we can run, not meander, not amble. You know, right? We're going to run into that strong tower because His name is what gives us our confidence and our strength, a strong tower. But I believe God wants us to be a strong people as well. 
And that is the, the focus that I want to draw our attention to this morning. And I'd love to have the kids help me out here in the beginning here as we get into the kids quiz. Who was the leader who led after Moses died? I'm not sure if that's good English saying it like that, but uh, that's how I said it. Anna, I saw your hand go right up. Do you know which guy this is up here? Who is it? Joshua. You are correct. Joshua was who was commissioned to lead. What shoes to fill when you think about it, right? I got to follow Moses. Wow. But Joshua was the man, and he was a, a great leader for God's people at this critical time. Number two, what was his dad's name? Do you remember this one? Joshua's dad's name, his father. He's known as Joshua, son of... All right, I saw you jump up over here. Son of who? Yeah, isn't that fun? You can do all kinds of things with that. None, right? So he, he didn't have a father? Oh, no, his father was a, a, a chaste Catholic woman. That's who his father, you know, he can do all kinds of things with none, right? But that was, his, you know, it, it, it didn't mean that, uh, obviously, for his dad. But that's Joshua, son of none. That was his, his father's name. True or false, Joshua was a spy. Oh, I saw, is that Ketzia? There you are, Ketzia, yeah. True or false, true or, was he a spy? He was the original James Bond, that's right. Joshua was one of them. No, before, before the conquest of, of Palestine, of course, uh, when Moses was uh, still part of the team, right, they send the 12 spies in. Joshua was one of the 12. He and Caleb come back as the only two with a good report, but they, they listen to the 10 who are weak in the knees and end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But Joshua was a spy sent out to look at the land. Number four, what was the first thing Joshua did when he took command after Moses died? Now, I put Joshua too. Not, not the commissioning of Joshua and, and uh, God speaking to Joshua and Joshua speaking to the people, but what, what, what was the first action he took? Did he send more spies to Jericho? Did he have Israel cross the Jordan? Was that the first? He attacked the Amalekites maybe? Or did he command the sun and moon to stand still? Which one is the first? What was the first thing he did? Do you remember? You can guess. It's all right. See, we don't even like to guess if we feel like it's going to be wrong. We're just too But Hannah, thank you so much. It is not B. Aren't you embarrassed, though? Yeah. <laughs> Anna, you are right, Anna. He, as a spy himself, Send spies into Jericho. Now, really, when you think about it, that's quite an interesting thing. He knows God has given him uh, the command to go in and, and take uh, the promised land across the Jordan. And even still, he sends spies. Um, and and uh, I, I think, although this isn't the, the, the bulk of the sermon, I think it wasn't so much to determine if they could conquer the uh, promised land, but to give them reconnaissance information about how best to go about it. And then the story of Rahab and all that takes place in that uh, story as well. So he sends only two spies this time. He said, I'm not dealing with that 12 spy thing again. That didn't work out so much. He only sent two spies. Two's the right number, and that's what he did. All right, last question. And this really is, uh, gets to the, the uh, title and the heart of the message. How many times was Joshua told to be strong and courageous in Joshua chapter 1? How many times is Joshua himself told, you need to be strong and courageous. Is he just told that one time, maybe? Twice, three, or four? Toby, it is not three times, so we're narrowing it down. Owen, you got it over here? Owen says four. Owen is correct. Four times, four times, just in that chapter alone. You would think uh, he would get it after the first or second time, but no, four times in Joshua chapter one, Joshua is told, three of them by God and one of them by Israel, to be strong and courageous. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is this is at the end of the wilderness wandering, right? Okay, They've already defeated the Amalekites. You remember, that was the story when Moses' arms were held up. Remember that? Okay, Joshua was the commander out fighting the Amalekites, and as long as Moses' hands were up, they would win the war, right? And so he got tired, and, and Aaron had to hold up one arm, and Hur had to hold up uh, the other arm, um, and, and, and Joshua wins the battle. He was pretty strong and courageous, wouldn't you say? I mean, he'd lived, they'd gone through the 40 years. They'd, they dealt with the fiery serpents. They'd been fed by manna. They'd had all these troubles during that wilderness wandering. And here at the end of the journey... 
as Moses has now died, Joshua is told four times, now's the time, Joshua, to be bold and create, or be strong and courageous. Not that he wasn't supposed to be that before, but it's reiterated time and time and time again. And it just begs the question, why did he need to do that? This is the end. The promised land is well, just across the muddy rivers of the Jordan, right? And, and, and we're there. We're nearing the end. And yet God saw fit to repeatedly command Joshua, don't forget to be strong and courageous. So we come back to this verse from last week, and it's just such a, a, just such a great reminder of, of, of our relationship with God and his provision for us. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and say, now here's the, here's the paradigm that I'm going to suggest to you of how this works. Yes, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Yes, we have safety, security in that relationship and that knowledge that we can go to Him. But we should not always just stay in that strong tower. God wants us to be a strong people to do His will. Some of us have been in that strong tower. Now, some of us are still running. Some of us are still running into that strong tower. We're still learning. We're still finding peace and, and, and that, that necessity and need to be in that place with God, right? But God also wants us to go forward and be a people who takes his message and his gospel to the world. There's a, a fascinating parallel to the story of Joshua at the Jordan River with Moses at the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14. I didn't put it on the screen. Um, I'm just going to read to it from my Bible. So uh, in, in a similar fashion, just as jo, jo, uh, excuse me, Joshua was with the children of Israel at the Jordan, so Moses, at the time of the Exodus, was with the Israelites at the Red Sea. And they had a decision to make. And they, you know, the Egyptians are charging down on them. So Exodus 14 and verse 13. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. That's a great thing to say. Stand by. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, they will be, uh, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Oh, such a powerful thing for Moses to say. You know, you're afraid. You've got the mountains. You've got the sea. And here come the enemy. What do we do? Moses says, stand by and see what God did. Stand firm. That'll preach, Jim. We could preach on that. I've heard sermons on that. I've heard Preachers powerfully just talk about when you're in a challenge, you stand firm and you watch the salvation of God and it's going to be wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But you got to read the next verse, right? What's the very next verse say? Then the Lord uh, 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 said to Moses, uh, Exodus 14, 15, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to move, go forward. You know, we sometimes accuse others of not always reading the Bible in context and picking and choosing. We need to be careful about that ourselves. You know, here Moses, in this very similar fashion, says, look, we can run into that strong tower and we can take, uh, uh, t you know, stand firm in the faith that God is going to fight for us and it's wonderful. And that's all true. But we have a responsibility with that relationship with God as well. Right? We are to move forward with God, right? Right? Why are you crying out to me? I, you know, Moses and God had a, they had a great relationship. Kind of a passive aggressive thing. I'm really looking forward to seeing these two in heaven as they converse because they had this, what he, literally in Hebrew, uh, if we were to be uh, more literal in the slang, God is telling Moses, stop whining. L literally, that's what he's saying. Stop whining to me, okay? As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, divide it. The sons of Israel shall go over the midst of the sea on dry land. Exactly what happens with Joshua, too, when they go through the Jordan River, the, the waters of the river split, and they go through on dry land. So you have these two uh, similar stories. And here, um, uh, uh, what I'm trying to share with you is that God, yes, is that strong tower, but he wants us to also be a strong people, right? He wants us to be a strong people. And he wants us to move forward and carry his plan of salvation through. So we come to um, Joshua chapter 1. Oh, excuse me. I wanted to mention this first. In Deuteronomy, so I mentioned, well, I'll just start here. Deuteronomy 31.6. This is before Moses has died and he's commissioning Joshua. And this is what he says to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Isn't that beautiful? 
He will not fail you or forsake you. So what I wanted to point out about this is when you add all together, in total, Joshua is told how many times? Seven times to be strong and courageous. Within a short period of time, Deuteronomy 31, Moses is kind of dying. He's at the end and he commissions Joshua and he tells Joshua, or Joshua is told three times in Deuteronomy, I put the verses there, and then four additional times in, in uh, the first chapter of Joshua. It's amazing how many times number seven pops up in the Bible, isn't it? You'd think there might be something to it. Joshua is told time and time again, now is the time for you to be strong and courageous. We are at the end of the wilderness wanderings. The promised land is near, but you need to be strong and courageous. And that's what I want to just uh, delve into a little bit. So here in Joshua chapter 1 is how the book begins. Now it came about at that time after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I'm giving, the, uh, giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Now I'm going to take just a, a little bit of a side note here because I can't help myself. Isn't it interesting that God himself says that Moses is dead? Okay, He did not say, Moses, my servant, is with me now in heaven. He is just doing great. He is at the banquet table. Joshua, you don't need to worry about He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, uh, Moses, my servant, is in purgatory. He doesn't say, Moses, my servant, is in limbo. He doesn't say, Moses, my servant, is in Abraham's bosom. All right? He doesn't say he's in paradise. Moses is dead. All right? He is dead. This is just another one of those passages that gives us confidence that the, the Bible clearly teaches that death is asleep. Because God here himself, he doesn't say the body of Moses is dead, but the spirit is with me. All right, we've separated them. All right, God himself speaks the, the truth about the reality of the nature of man. Even Moses, even Moses is dead. Now we know Moses appears in the New Testament in the Mount of Transfiguration. So at some point, God does do a special resurrection for uh, Moses. And there's a, a small little snippet in the book of Jude that see, uh, about the devil and, uh, and the Lord arguing about the, the, uh, the body of Moses. And, and that, that's a, a fun Bible study for another time. But here it makes it very clear that Moses, like everyone else, dies a death where uh, there is sleep. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Like I said, they were kind of at the end of the journey. You know, in Scripture, you know, in, in the symbolism of, of, uh, the, uh, of righteousness by faith and, and salvation, they, you know, coming out of Egypt is like, you know, getting saved, right? You're out of slavery, right? You're out of the bondage of sin. That's the symbol. And then you come through the Red Sea, right? And the Red Sea is a symbol of baptism, right? Paul says that in 1 Corinthians, all right? They were baptized into the sea. So the, 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 the journey of the Israelites is synonymous to the journey of each individual uh, in their walk with God, right? And then after they're saved, notice this, after they're saved, they, and they've been through the Red Sea, they get the law, they get the sanctuary, and they get the community, right? God gives these beautiful things. You need the law, you need the sanctuary, you need the community in order for this to be successful, all right. Then because of their lack of faith and struggles, they wander in the wilderness, symbolizing our journey in life, the, the ups and downs, the serpents that we have to deal with, and the lack of food or the lack of provision, having to trust in God, and all the challenges that we experience in life. All right. And then when we get to the end, we're supposed to go to the promised land, right? We're supposed to cross that last river and be in heaven. You with me and, and how that journey is supposed to work? So all of this is, is part of that symbolism of the journey of faith. And so they're at that point where they're nearing the end. And of course, there's more that is to happen as they come into the conquest of the promised land. They, they cross the Jordan. And uh, again, these pictures make it look like the Jordan's like the Mississippi. The Jordan's actually like a, a muddy little brook. Um, during the, the rainy season, it swells a little bit, but it's actually a fairly uh, small river. And then God begins to tell Joshua, be strong and courageous. This is the first time in Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to, uh, to their fathers to give them. And I just thought to myself, what does that mean? Be strong and courageous. What does that mean? Be, be strong in what? Uh, you know, be strong in military tactics? 
uh, be strong in, in, in uh, you know, political wisdom and policy of how to organize the government of Israel. Be strong in, in, in muscles. You know, we need to you know, lift weights. Be strong and courageous. Be strong in ourselves. Oh, there's uh, lots of movie references that jump to my mind right now, but I'm going to skip those um, for now. I'll let you think of that yourself. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. For me, I think part of the answer comes in the very next verse. And I want to show that with you this morning. When God immediately repeats the same thing, but there's an additional add-on here. All right, this is how it says in Joshua 1.7. Be strong and very courageous. That very is added. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left so that you may have success wherever you go. All right? So this is now the fifth time that Joshua has been told to be strong and courageous. But there's something added. And I, 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 I made this look a little funny on purpose. Do you see what that is there? Yeah, that's called a semicolon. All right? Now, um, uh, this is from the New American Standard, which is the Bible I use the most for my study and, and preaching and memorization. And there, I don't have a, uh, a bias necessarily that uh, one Bible is superior to the other. This is just the one that, that works for me. All modern translations have pros and cons, and I think it's worthy of, of, of looking at a variety of things. The New American Standard decided to use a semicolon there. And I know you guys are excited to learn about English punctuation and that that's just the most dynamic thing in the world. A semicolon is uh, really not related to a colon at all. It shouldn't be called a semicolon. It's really uh, more related to a comma. It's, it's saying that the two independent clauses are related. Isn't that exciting? I just know you, did, you, you need to write that down because your spiritual journey will be so much encouraged by knowing that that's what that semicolon. But here's the idea. The, the translators of the New American Standard said there is a relationship between the first clause and the second clause, all right? Um, I want to show you how some other Bibles do it. This is from the English Standard Version and the New Revised Standard. They say only be strong and courageous. They choose to just use a comma. But they use this word being. Be strong and very courageous, being careful to observe all that Moses has commanded you. Joshua, uh, or the NIV and the New Living, uh, they simply give a period. Now, this is actually a good resource to understand when you're doing your Bible study. You ought to pay attention to these things sometimes. These things were not inspired. There was no punctuation when these things were written. These are interpretations of the writers putting them in. And sometimes they have profound meaning. And to me, this is the, uh, this is the most discouraging one because they're saying there's no relationship between these clauses. They are separate and distinct and should not be considered as one. The others at least put commas or semicolons. And so they are making a decision for you, all right? All right, uh, those of you who use King James or, or a New King James, be strong and very courageous. They insert the word, the demonstrative, that. They're the only ones that do that, okay? Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe. And there's two different ways that can be understood. By being strong and courageous, then you'll be able to observe. But it can also mean as you're strong and courageous, you will observe. So it can mean both of those. Um, and by the way, this is the 1900 version of the King James. I, 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 again, I don't have a burden. If you love the King James, that's fine. But the six, if I was to hand you a 1611 version of the King James, you would not be able to read it. I, just, I, I get tickled a little bit about the people who are really um, obsessed about the King James, and it, they just feel that, oh, it's the perfect one. It's never changed. Thousands of changes have been made to the King James. All right, And, and if you want to arm wrestle over it later, we can do that. Um, I, I just wanted to share, there's been many, many changes to the King James. And it's not a bad translation. David, I'm not picking on the King James. Okay, don't get mad at me. It's all right. All right. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou may observe. They insert the demonstrative, that. Now, here I want to give you my favorite one. And the reason why it's my favorite, it's not because it's my personal uh, uh, opinion, but because I think it reflects, and most scholars that have studied this phrase agree that there is a causal relationship between the first uh, independent clause and the second independent clause. This is actually a non-published Bible. It's online only. It's called the Lexham English Bible. Um, but I have it as part of my Bible study software. L listen to how this one translates it. Only be strong and very courageous to 
observe diligently. Do you notice the difference? I know I went through that kind of fast. The strength and courage that God calls Joshua to have is not some kind of independent willpower, not some kind of just uh, uh, you know self ego, uh, 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 um, you know self worth determination. God specifically calls Joshua at this critical juncture to experience strength in his study and relationship and devotion to the law of God. Do you understand? Be strong and courageous to observe diligently the whole law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. The strength that you need and the diligence and the courage is to be expressed in your devotion to the, uh, to the Bible. Okay, I think I can say it that way without stretching it too much. Your strength your courage must be in fidelity and in relationship and in study and observance and love of the revealed word that I've already given you. You've lost Moses, but you still have him. He's with you. Be diligent. That's where your strength and courage is to be found. Are you Seventh-day Adventists today? Are we still the people of the book? Are we still the remnant people of prophecy? Do we still devote ourselves to the study of God's Word and to the relationship of God's character with His law? So well, I don't even understand what that means. What in the world does you know, you know, observing the Sabbath have to do with navigating the trials of the last days? Well, friends, if you don't have Jesus at your side, if you're not resting in the salvation that we get to experience and manifest every Sabbath, your last day experience is going to be of a great, much greater trial than it need be. Right? All of the aspects of God's truth and law is not just for some intellectual exercise, but it has real application to strengthening us to face the trials that we are facing right now. Friends, we are at the Jordan River right now. There is not much prophecy left. We are there. We've already done the wilderness wandering. We've already faced the fiery serpents. We've already seen the miracles of the manna. We are at the Jordan. And if there's any community that should be strong, if there's any community that should be courageous at this time in earth's history, it should be the seventh day Adventist church. We should have that strength. There is more. I've asked several people this before. I love history. Love history. Uh, I didn't live uh, all of it. I haven't lived very much of it, but I love to study. And I've asked people who've lived in the 50s, who lived in the 60s, who lived in the 70s, is the division that our country in right now anything like what it was during civil rights or during, um, you know, uh, uh, the 60s and and, uh, uh, Woodstock and, and Kent State and all that. And everyone to a person has said, no, it is much worse today. Every single one has told me that. And we are hearing echoes and ideas promoted in our culture and our society right now specifically designed to divide divide and distract and destroy us and i don't care i try not to get political i don't want to choose sides one way or the other i don't know how you feel about critical race theory i don't know how you feel about vaccines or whatever you may have strong opinions one way or the other and that's fine but we are at a time when we're not even allowed to express those opinions at times and these are, the, these are the precursors. These are the historical realities that has led to every kind of oppression that we've seen in history. Right now, there are, are major influential media, social media, entertainment, and political uh, leaders, thought leaders, calling for public shaming of people who feel differently about what they want to do with their body. There are political and media figures that are calling literally calling and have millions of followers agreeing with them that people who are unvaccinated should not receive treatment if they go to the hospital. We have major political and media people calling for legal prosecution of those who feel differently about things like critical race theory or COVID. 
Now, I have a question for you. How long is it before the call for public shaming becomes the call for public blaming? How far are we where the call for lack of treatment becomes the call for mistreatment? And how far is it from the call from legal persecution to religious persecution? Every historical reality of, of challenges that, are fa- that we've seen from McCarthyism to Nazism to Bolshevism to Jap- Japanese imperialism to European nationalism have all charted this course. We ban books first, then we censor ideas, and then we silence opposition. Has your faith ever really been tested? Because it might be tested soon. All across this country right now, people are losing jobs. They're losing relationships. They're losing their homes because they're standing up for what they believe in. We may be isolated or protected or insulated in some ways in our own family right now, but God calls us to be a strong people. He calls us to be strong Strong in our relationship with Him through knowing that He has already seen these things happen. Just one one brief story. Some of you have heard when Gene and I talked about our our testimony and coming into the church. Probably the one most significant time that uh, my faith was tested in this very tangible, real way was when I was working at Costco. And forgive me if you've already heard this story, but I I became a Seventh-day Adventist while working at Costco. Yay! Okay. And uh, Costco's a great place to work for. You got good benefits, good retirement, good pay. They take care of you. I was newly married. Uh, Gina was pregnant at the time. We still had debt. Having that job was pretty important, all right? I needed that job, right? But I'd become a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'd said, look, I I can't work on Saturday anymore. Now, you understand in big retail, nobody gets Saturday off, right? Nobody gets Saturday off. But I I had said, you know, I've made the decision. And so... um, uh, on my application, though, when I had uh, uh, applied to work there, there was a question, are you willing to work seven days a week? And I had said, yeah, because I wasn't an Adventist at that time. And so I had said, yeah, I'm w- willing to work seven days a week. So I got called into the manager's office, and uh, um, big manager's office, and he sits down, and he holds up that application and says, Dave, I, I know you want to, uh, you, you, you've had a change, you want to keep Saturday off, but you've already said that you're going to work seven days. Did you lie when you fill that out? That's what he said to me. Did you lie? You know, and I'd, I'd been praying a lot about it at that time, and, and, you know, I was nervous. I mean, I was scared, but I had a peace. I had a peace about me. And I didn't know about religious liberty and all that at this time, and so I just, I just kind of surrendered, and I said, I know I did. I feel terrible that I've changed. I said, but I have changed. I've had a change in my life. I've had a different conviction, and now my conviction is that the seventh day belongs to the Lord, and I, I, I just can't work that day. And I said, um, I said, I realize you may need to, uh, and I honestly to this day don't remember if I said, you, if you need to fire me um, or if you just need to let me go. Because if you say that to someone, it's almost like you're poking the bear, right? If you need to fire me, uh, well, then uh, I understand. I don't, I don't remember if I said that. I think I said, Mark, I said, if you need to let me go, um, I, I understand that. And I realized if that happened, I might lose my insurance, what little you know, benefits I was getting for retirement, that good paying job starting out a new life with with my wife um and i was scared but i had peace and i just had this peace if god promised he'd take care of me what do i have to fear what do i have to fear can god not get me another job can god not solve that issue and i said i said you know if you need to let me go just i understand and uh, I think he understood religious liberty better than I do because he's, oh, no, 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 we'll, fall, we'll solve this. And I ended up being uh, able to keep my job working at Costco until uh, the Lord called me into ministry. But that's one of those times when, I, again, I realized in, in the grand scheme of things, my life wasn't on the line necessarily and things like that. But that was one of the severe tests of my faith. And at that moment, I trusted in the Lord, and he gave me the courage and peace to be able to do that. I had been heavily in the Word studying as I transitioned from my my Pentecostal church to Adventism. And it was that relationship with God through the Word that gave me that strength. It wasn't my strength. It was His strength. 
And I think we need that strength today. I think we need that strength today, guys. Wherever you fall on a lot of these issues, that's fine. But there's a certain level of decency and harmony and unity that should exist among God's people. And we may be at the Jordan River spiritually as well. Now is not the time to throttle back on your relationship with God. Now is not the time to skip Sabbath school. Now is not the time to avoid the prayer meeting. Now is not, maybe now's the time to have a visioning meeting, George. Maybe that's a good time. What do you think? What else should we be doing? What else should we be doing? Finally, notice how Paul says it in Ephesians. Be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Be strong in the Lord. Well, how do we be strong in the Lord? It's through a relationship with Him. It's through His Word. It's through worship. It's through fellowship and community. It's through by allowing His Holy Spirit to unite us together. And then, because uh, I knew the young adults were studying Philippians chapter 4 today. How, what, is, what does he say? I can do how many things through Him who gives me strength? I can do most things. Amen. I can do many things. Hallelujah. I can do a bunch of great things. Are any of you listening? <laughs> I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Be strong and very courageous, church. Will you pray with me? God, each of us is wrestling with life in our own way. Each of us has trials. Each of us have burdens. Each of us have unique opportunities, and yet there are some that affect all of us similarly. God, we are a community that you want to be a shining light in these last days. We know that the devil is a deceiver and a liar, and he is doing everything he can to destroy our faith and our ability to see across that Jordan River, that promised land. And he is going to do everything he can to prevent us from taking those steps. He has not given up, Lord. Help us, Father, to find that beautiful balance of running to you as our strong tower, as Jesus did, as our example. He went into the wilderness and prayed. He, he spent all night in prayer, and he found strength in his relationship with his father. But then when morning came, he came out filled with power and grace and compassion to serve. Lord, may that be our example as well, that we would run into that strong tower and we would be changed and blessed so that you could then send us in strength and power to know your will and to move forward. Father, I just ask that you would bless us in this. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I let you go, I, there was one thing I wanted to say and I forgot about it. I do not want to be an alarmist or a fear monger. It is my prayer that tomorrow cooler heads prevail and, and more reasonable dialogue begins throughout our country, right? Okay? I know that that can happen, but I do have, feel a sense of obligation to also share with you we need to be ready and have our eyes open. Amen? Amen. God bless you on this Sabbath. We look forward to seeing you Friday night at 6.30. Friday night, 6.30. God bless. Sure.